I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, three friends, really, from the press corps here that are Texas-based reporters. Um, as Rick Perry began running for president, and we could maybe have a discussion about when we thought that was, I suppose, um, it really occurred to me that there would, there would come a time when this would be a great event to have. Um, so what I've, what I've, who I've gathered here today are three Texas-based reporters, all of whom have, have covered Governor Perry uh, for quite some time, but now have had the opportunity also to travel with him on the road during the presidential campaign. So immediately to my left is Jason Embry of the Austin American Statesman. Uh, immediately to his left, Christy Hoppe of the Dallas Morning News. And at the end of the table, Mr. Jay Root, uh, currently of the Texas Tribune. So I really want to start, y'all, and thank you all for coming again. And I want to start really with a, you know, a pretty general question. It's the question I think everybody's sort of asking in the, in the last week or so. Um, given the ups and downs and the trajectory of the Perry campaign so far, you know, people are either emphasizing the downs or emphasizing, or emphasizing the ups. I mean, on the downside, I suppose you would have debate performances, some of the polling recently. Um, on the upside, the recent fundraising uh, numbers that the Perry campaign has turned in. And depending on your reading, I would say actually the polls could be read in a less negative way than some people are reading them. So I kind of want to start down at the end with you, Jay, and, and just give us your general opening shot. What's the state of the Perry candidacy right now? I think they stopped the bleeding with this uh, announcement of the fundraising figures. I mean, they were really, for, for a while there, it kind of seemed like they were in free fall. I mean, it just, he, he really, really hurt himself in Florida. Um, that was the, the last debate, and it was the Florida straw poll. And, uh, you know, Jason and I were there, and, and, you know, I remember going into that crowd with all those delegates. It's basically a convention. They call it Presidency Five. And they were so, they, they really wanted to be for Perry. They, they were, I, I, I'm convinced that Perry would have won that straw poll if, if it hadn't been for the debate. And he really, he blew it. I mean, he really, really blew it at the debate uh, for two reasons. One, he completely lost the punditry with his shaky, uneven performance. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced he was tired. Um, and he, there were, you know, well-known moment now where he seemed confused. Um, and, uh, and then also his answer on immigration was, was just radioactive. I mean, it was just completely radioactive. It, he, he took a bad situation and made it worse, where it, it was already a net negative for him to be in favor of in-state tuition. It's not a huge deal in Texas, but the, being for in-state tuition for illegal immigrants who graduate from high school, it's just radioactive in the Republican primary right now. And he made it just way worse by saying that, suggesting that uh, the opponents were heartless. Um, and it just was really stuck a, a stick in their eye, and, and he was very shaky. And so that just, just provoked this, this free fall where he was, you know, lost his front runner status and was, was really, really hurting. And then I think that the campaign, there, there was really sort of a come to Jesus moment, and they, they, they realized that, uh, they had to do something that that uh, uh, I think you're you're, you're going to see that they're going to sketch they're going to do a little bit better on the scheduling. I mean, they they've just sort of overscheduled him. Um, I think they're going to get him some debate prep, which he obviously needed. Um, and then they had this this first sort of positive announcement that they raised seventeen point one million dollars, which is really quite a lot of money to have raised in forty nine days. Um, you know, the other candidates that have been in this the whole time had the whole quarter. He didn't have the whole quarter to raise that amount of money. So it was a lot of money. Um, I think, you know, the question now is what do they do with it and how do they get things back on track? And I think that um, in the, the same way that it was never going to be a waltz to the nomination, I, I always thought that was kind of crazy when people said he was going to waltz to the nomination. I also think it's kind of crazy to say, oh, he's over, he's imploded. I mean, it shows you the fickle nature a little bit of, of the echo chamber that is the national press. Yeah, I want to get to the there. internals a little bit more later. But so, st so short answer, stop the bleeding. I think he stopped the bleeding. What do you think, Christy? I think when he got into it, it was um, everybody had projected everything they wanted him to be. Uh, and when he started actually speaking, it became a little bit more difficult. Uh, and, and the answers became not exactly what a lot of people wanted to hear. 
Um, it's like speed dating. Um, boy, he looks pretty good. Boy, you know, he, he seems to have a nice resume. Boy, you know, he seems kind of smart. And then by the second or third or fourth date, you're, you're, and you have to decide whether this is the person you want to marry, it, you hold it up to a different kind of scrutiny. And I think that's what happened to, to Perry a little bit down the road here. I think um, he misjudged I, 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 in the debates. I think it was his, I, I agree with Jay, it was his uh, terrible performance that cost him so much. Uh, it was um, a repeat of bad performance, actually. And so uh, the, there, there was um, a lot of concern raised there. I, I'm concerned that, that Perry thought that he thought he could wing a presidential debate, and this is what hurt him some. I mean, uh, Jay talked about scheduling. Uh, most times when you're doing debate prep, you take it very seriously, you cancel out anything else for that day, and you sit down and you have, you know, you're going through the books and you're honing your answers and you're trying to uh, uh, lay out what you want to say in the best possible manner. And Perry was going and giving speeches that day. Um, so uh, you're tired, you're not on message, and you're going to um, a, a very big forum and you're trying to do it on the, on the fly, and it didn't work for him. I, I, I think the campaign will change. Um, I think you'll see a lot more debate prep. I mean, that goes without saying. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's too early to count Perry out by any stretch of the means. I mean, the echo chamber likes, you know, the conflicts, likes the winner, likes the horse race. But uh, it's, it's um, still another four months. He's got um, a long way to go, and I think he's got a very strong base of, of evangelical, of conservatives, of, of uh, social conservatives, of, uh, 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 you know, uh, he's got a, a good money train. Now, here's the problem. I mean, he's already tapped out half of his $17 uh, million came from Texas. And you can only give $2,500 a shot for this part of the campaign. So he can't go back to those people. What will be interesting is after this initial bloom is off the rose in the next quarter, how will he do in terms of bringing in new uh, funding? Uh, that said, $17 million will take you a long way. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Perry is, is uh, understanding that this is not going to be all retail politics, what she's good at. It's going to be a lot of uh, better honing of his message and, uh, and more discipline. What do you think? Same? Or? Yeah, yeah, I do think pretty much the same. I mean, I think um, uh, everything that they said is correct. I think obviously Perry is in a very, has been in a, in a bad spot in the, over the last couple weeks. I think um, another, another reason why he should be discouraged is what has happened with uh, Christie's decision this week. Not necessarily that Christie isn't running, because I don't, I don't know if that was entirely unexpected, but just how it's, it's, I think, put out an impression, at least to some, that now is the time uh, for a lot of Republican bigwigs around the country to, if they're going to, to really get behind Romney. And so uh, you've seen in the last couple of days, you know, Romney has, has done some things to really establish some momentum with those folks who were maybe waiting for Christie. Some of the people that were courting Christie, like the founder of Home Depot, quickly went to Romney. Some elected officials in key states. Uh, I guess I didn't know until the last couple of days that Florida has three speakers of the House. I still don't really understand how that works, but they are all with Romney. Uh, and uh, you know, so I think that that that's something. I mean, this morning, you know, Romney put out just this really, you know, long list of his sort of foreign policy advisors and team and everything. Now, I don't know if Perry will have a list that can match that, but so far he hasn't uh, had anything like that. On the other hand, I think a couple of reasons why uh, Perry is not in too bad of a spot. One is that, you know, they've got another debate coming up Tuesday and then another one a week from, and then the following Tuesday. And, uh, you know, obviously, he is, I think, going to be preparing for that more. I mean, we haven't seen much publicly from Perry this week, I think, because he's been raising money, and I think also probably because he's been doing debate prep. I mean, today he's having a fundraiser out at Steiner Ranch, and then I, I would imagine that he's spending a lot of the day doing debate prep type stuff. Um, and so I think, you know, going into that debate, the expectations, obviously, for Perry are very low, and that's not a bad place to be. Um, I think it could be fairly easy if he does improve his performance, and obviously there's a lot of room for improvement, then he can you know, start to turn around that narrative even more like he started to with the 
uh, fundraising report. And, and the other thing is, and I mean, I don't know if this is jumping ahead of us, but you know, you see in the polls, you know, national poll after national poll, he has gone down, but Romney's not really moving much. I mean, people have moved basically from Perry to Herman Cain. And I think for many reasons, they're probably not gonna stay with Herman Cain, um, just because he's not gonna have the money. He doesn't have, he, he's, you know, he's, it's confusing people whether he's really running a campaign or whether he's running a book tour. And so, you know, will those people who are with Cain, will they, when they leave Cain, which I think some of, a lot of them will, you know, well, they're more likely to go to Perry or Romney. Yeah. Well, you, you guys all talked a little bit about the, the debate prep, the, you know, him being tired, the travel schedule, and the travel schedule has been brutal. Um, I think going into this, there was an assumption that Perry ran a great campaign. I mean, an assumption. There's a lot of evidence that his campaign team was very sharp, uh, that they had run a lot of good campaigns, they, they clicked well with their candidate. You guys have been on the road, and you all talked to the campaign people for the record on background. How, how good a job is the campaign doing, and how are, they, how are they doing at raising their game to the national level? What do you think, Jason? Well, I, I, I almost think it's too early to tell. I mean, I think that you know, they, did, they did a great job this summer with the buildup to the campaign and the anticipation and, and getting this story out that people were coming to Austin to beg him to run all summer and then they were, um, you know, and then, you know, the whole story with, with Mrs. Perry asking to get in. I mean, I'm not saying that that's um, not what happened, but, uh, you know, they really, they built up to that well. He had the great um, sort of blast off at the Red State Bloggers Convention and all of that. So I think up until that point, they had done really well. Now, you know, um, lately, I mean, obvious, obviously something they're doing is not working. I mean, they are not, whether it's just not preparing him well enough uh, for the debates, whether it's not, you know, giving him enough sort of substantive policy to talk about uh, instead of just talking about sort of his tenets of Texas, of low taxes and low regulation and all that. Uh, you know, obviously there are some problems there. I think, you know, national reporters, you know, you sort of hear mixed things in terms of uh, whether they are responding to them. You hear a lot that they're not, but, you know, some that they are. So I think, you know, there was a story, there was a quote somewhere um, this, this past week about how Dave Carney, who's sort of uh, Perry's Carl Rove, uh, said, you know, it, it's, I'm going to I'm going to sort of screw this up but basically said that it's like conduct running a campaign is like conducting an orchestra and you know of course he will say that everything is sort of going right along schedule so you know we'll we'll see but I will say that there is a there is a heavy reliance in the Perry organization a very heavy reliance on the people in Texas who have helped him run his Texas campaigns and below the highest level with Carney I don't know if there is a lot of presidential experience there and that may be something that we're seeing there's kind of a gray area whenever you talk about this, about where the, where the camp, you know, what the campaign really does and where at a certain level when the rubber hits the road, the candidate has to do it. I mean, I, I kind of wonder where that is. What do you think, Christy? You've, you know a lot of those people. I think nothing <laughs> prepares you for a presidential run um, except a presidential run. I, I, I think um, it's a whole different game. And once you've played in Texas and you have a longstanding uh, incumbent that everybody knows and they have their message and they are clicking on all fours and, and they just head right through the Republican primary and then they're elected governor because no Democrat's going to win a statewide election in Texas right now. When you try and take that game of media control, of just retail politics, of not having to do debates, of not having policy white papers, of not having any overall message about where you're taking the state when you're just trying to do a, I can create jobs, trust me, that is not a message that's gonna play well on a national level. You, in Texas, you don't have a 24-7 news cycle where there are pundits every day judging everything that you're doing and, and renewing it again at, at, at 12 and two and four and six and eight, and then you have all the people kicking them around the ball, around the table, many of whom don't know you and don't necessarily like you. Um, so they have, um, I, I, I agree with Jason, up to the red state announcement, they had timed everything extremely well and calibrated everything. And then, uh, you know, 
virtually the next day, he's calling Ben Bernanke a traitor. And then the next day after that, he's saying he doesn't believe in global warming. And then the next day after that, he's saying he doesn't believe in evolution. And all of a sudden, you are off message, and things are starting to spin out of control. And so um, that's something he hadn't run across in Texas, not being able to control his message. I think, it's, I think it's very entertaining to see how, you know, in the initial rollout and beyond the, the, the buildup, it was actually beyond that, there's this idea that's been implanted out there. You know, I'm thinking of like Washington lobbyist types and, and the mystique was built, built up that, you know, this guy is, the, you know, the second coming and um, he's going to just walk away with this and these guys are geniuses, you know, and the minute things start going south, it's like, oh my God, they're country bumpkins, they can't do anything. <laughs> so it's, just, it, it's, a, it's, it's similar to this bouncing around of, of, his, of his fortunes. It's, it's like they're either completely ridiculous idiots or they're geniuses. And, you know, as usual, the truth lies somewhere between. I think that the strength of the Texas-based staff is that they're they're much more cohesive and they know each other and you know there's a loyalty oath i mean look at look at how the numbers did not leak out it was per they knew exactly exactly when and who they were going to leak that to and they did it and they executed it and they pulled it off you mean the campaign finance yeah, numbers right yeah. right at the moment when they really needed to do it and where it ended up on drudge report that's who you know, so, I mean, which is a pretty maximum impact type thing. Well, especially since the recent narrative has been that they had a, you know, quote-unquote, right. a drudge problem. Right, right. But there's a very high degree of coordination in terms of the control of that piece of information. There was no, like, you know, there was no leaking of it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people and, you know, th these sources are getting worked. I can guarantee you that you know, the reporters are calling, come on, man, is it, you know, give me a hint. Is it warmer? Is it 15? Is it 18? Is it 19? Is it 17? What is it, you know? And, and, and they, they really sat on it. And, you know, so, so on that level, I think you see there is a sort of, uh, there is a positive side to having that cohesiveness and people that have worked together before. On the negative side, I think Christie's exactly right. The best preparation for running for president, really, is having run for president before. I mean, th that's where the Romney, uh, that's where I think that Romney, despite the s considerable doubt in the electorate about him, um, I, I think Romney in many ways has earned the, the poll numbers where he's at. I mean, there, there's so much doubt about Romney. I mean, he's like, you know, he made some, you know, he's seen as a flip-flopper, rightly or wrongly, by a, by a significant group of people. Um, and so he's, he's been able to overcome a lot of that, and he's gotten to where he's gotten uh, with, with a lot of experience and discipline. Um, and one other thing that I would say, sort of in defense of the staff, in defense of the Texas-based staff, is that most of Perry's problems really have been self-inflicted. I mean, his, his last, his first debate deform, performance, I was in the spin room in California, in Simi Valley, California, and I heard a couple of people saying he was wobbly, and I kept hearing that, that term. The second and third debates were, you know, they just got worse. I mean, the second debate is when he gave the answer of saying that, you know, if you think I can be bought for $5,000, I'm right. offended, and that, that was a horrendous <laughs> answer. That's one of the worst answers you know, that has really ever been delivered in a debate, probably. And, and I mean, and he did it, he did it to himself. I mean, and I think he would, I think he would be candid. So I was, think, there, was there a lot of this going on in the I, spin room? I, I mean, I, I think that he would recognize, I think that he would acknowledge that that was not a good answer. That's not the answer that he really wanted to give. And I, I think that he would, you know, he, 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 we've been around him long enough to know that what he would really say is, that, you know, it doesn't matter, I'm, I'm not, we've heard it a million times, can't, you know, he's told it to us a million times. Campaign contributions and decisions are not tied to each other, even, even if you think they are, they're not. Um, and then in the third debate, I mean, he, he really ran out of gas at the end and, you know, uh, lost the punditry. And the one thing that he was eloquent on, the very eloquent on, immigration was a, just issue-wise was just killer. Do you think there's somebody on the staff that can 
that they can sit, will they sit down with him? And can he hear, you know, Governor, that was a terrible answer. I think so. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily any one particular person, but I mean, I've heard from people who have been through, you know, they do these deals where they, where they, uh, they in, to prepare for debates, they sort of cast various uh, people in their circle or Texas politicians to play their opponents. Um, and so, uh, uh, like they had, a few years ago, they had uh, Jerry Patterson, the land commissioner, play the role of Kinky Friedman when they were getting ready for that <laughs> circus of a 2006 debate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard that in those sessions uh, that, that they are very tough on him and that he takes it. I mean, he sits there and absorbs it. and. Yeah. And you know, and and uh, it's not. I mean, it is. It is a. It is a remarkably tight circle in Perry world, and it's not. It's one where there is a lot of loyalty to the politician, and I think uh, he treats them well. And I think that part of that is is that he's not somebody. I mean, to a certain degree, at least, I, I don't think that he's somebody that the staff, you know, lives in fear of the way they might with um, some of the people that he's run against. I think there's a column in casting figures from current Texas politics as the <laughs> other presidential contenders. That would be but fun. We'll leave that. Except um, nobody's heard of them. <laughs> I want to, um, we'll start with you this time, Christy, so, that, so that we can rotate a little bit. All of you have talked a little bit in talking about the campaign team about media strategy. There's a, there's a piece in the Huffington Post today complaining mightily about how, about the, the Perry campaign not returning phone calls and you know, freezing out the press and not doing enough public events. And, you know, we've talked about this, I, I guess you, at least Jay was there, I guess, but I've talked to all of you, I think, about this either on the phone or something about how they handle the press. Do you think, how are they handling the press? Has it changed for the, how, how has it changed for the presidential campaign? Do you think you guys are getting better treatment than the national press? No. <laughs> I, a resounding no. Um, this is going to be a 3-0 uh, <laughs> vote here. Yeah. <laughs> Three no's. I think um, they have, uh, you know, it goes back to in Texas, they were used to being able to very much to um, control message and limit access. And that has, uh, and that they are trying to play that end game still. And to a certain extent, you can do that, you can't do it this early in the campaign. Uh, later in the campaign, and, and I've seen this repeatedly in presidential campaigns, you have all sorts of access to the candidate through Iowa and to some extent through New Hampshire, and then all of a sudden it closes up. As you get down to two or three candidates, um, they get into a much more controlled situation uh, in which it's very limited um, uh, press conferences. Occasionally the candidate will come back in a plane and talk to you. Occasionally um, they'll do local uh, for local questions. But other than that, they really are trying to control the message. But it's too early to try and do that. And what you see the Perry campaign trying to do, and to which to an extent they all do, is limit him to um, Fox and limit him to who they think will be friendly questioners. And they are doling out parcels of information to, to um, uh, uh, breed trust and help, such as the Drudge Report, giving them this tidbit of information, giving uh, the Des Moines Register this point of information, giving Fox News this interview. And so, uh, and he's doing a lot of conservative radio right now. But in terms of making him available to the gaggle of press like he was the first week out of the campaign, you're not seeing hardly that anymore. Um, they're, they're closing him off, they're putting him to, you know, um, he gave a, a two-minute interview to Fox News today, which is the first press availability he's had since the Endgate uh, uh, story broke on Sunday. And this is four days, and, and multiply that by a, a division of, you know, 16 news cycles later. And uh, it's, this is the first time he's out there talking about how offensive that word is and that he wouldn't stand for it. And I, I would suggest this is something he needed to get out on a lot faster. So um, the Texas press, he already has Texas locked up. To answer your short question, we are frozen out more than most. We don't have a national outlet. People in Texas already know him and will vote for him. And therefore, we're pretty low on the piking order right now. Jay, are you not getting your phone calls returned? I, I can't disagree with anything. I wish I could. I cannot disagree with anything that Christy just said. Um, and 
um, I, I'm, I'm reminded continually of the 2000 campaign it, it, because it was the other moment when I was also I had, happened to be covering uh, Governor George W. Bush at the time when he was running for president. And they actually had, it, it wasn't a perfect strategy, but they did have a Texas media strategy. They knew that you know, they had to do something. And, and, you know, they would give us interviews, and a lot of times it would be like 10 minutes, and it was like, you know, me and Christy or and Wayne or, you know, and uh, Ken Herman or, you know, a few people all at one time. But you know, there was a little bit of, you know, there, there was some of that. Um, uh, I also think that I agree that they, there's this, uh, attempt to try to get around the media. Um, and you saw that a lot in 2010. And I mean, in some ways, they're on to something. In some ways, they are on to something. I mean, you know, we would all like to say, just open everything up and have gaggles. I mean, that first week was, was, was incredible. That first week of the campaign was, you know, I thought, it, this is going to be like the best thing ever. I want to go on every single trip and from treasonous to you know, the Michelle Bachman event when, when he was there and we were in Iowa and he kind of showed up Michelle Bachman at her own hometown event and, you know, she was out and she wouldn't come in and he was just talking to everybody and those days are gone. I mean, Pretty much you know, ended the Bachman campaign that night. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, but like, it was the know, night after the straw poll. And, yeah. yeah. Two weeks later, you know, I was in, I was in New Hampshire and um, there was a, a, an advance person there and uh, she had gotten confused about, you know, where the, well, she wasn't confused. She knew where she wanted us, but then I, I, I the CNN, a CNN camera woman and I both kind of got up close, and she was like, you can't be in there, and then she got, uh, she got in it with a, uh, somebody from the campaign, from the Perry campaign, and she said, well, I was told I was supposed to keep them pinned in here, so it was like, okay, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's definitely frustrating, but, you know, I, I can't sit here and tell you either that my answer would necessarily be beneficial to them. I mean, my answer would be, hey, give me an interview and have, you know, a lot of open press avails after events so that we can, you know, follow up questions. I do think, though, that ultimately when you close yourself off, then what happens is then when you get into a debate, there's all this pin up. What about this? What about this? What about this? And then it, you know, it, it, it can be difficult for, for you to be able to respond to that kind of demand. You guys have all traveled with him. Can you give us a little bit of a taste of, you know, how he's how he's doing in places that are not Texas? I remember watching uh, in Iowa, and it's, I'm actually going back out on the road tomorrow. It's been a while since I've been out there, but I remember, you know, I mean. The, it, you know, first couple of days after he announced, he was working the Iowa State Fair. I mean, he was great. I mean, he's, you know, he's, I mean, I say that he's the only 61-year-old uh, man I know who can walk around saying it's all good and not just sort of sound like uh, like he's really out of place. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's bringing, you know, just strangers. He'd be grabbing them and bringing them in. He's very physical, um, you know, and, uh, and it was working really well. And then I remember um, in New Hampshire that same week, a couple days later, um, and this is the, at the breakfast event where uh, he had the sort of the infamous comments about global warming. And, you know, he gave a speech. He took questions for half an hour, I think, or so, um, covered a lot of ground and everything. And I remember uh, I was in the back of the room and, you know, you had a bunch of, you know, business types and everything uh, who were si sitting at circular tables. And I just remember as soon as he started speaking, I remember seeing one guy who was right in my line of sight, looked at the people at his table and he was like, oh. Wow, like, you know, who the hell is this guy? And so, um, you know, it not it's so far, at least, I wasn't there last weekend when he did a bunch of events, but that initial impression was um, that he played a lot better uh, in Iowa than in, than in New Hampshire, which I, don't, which I think doesn't come as much of a surprise. I mean, you know, uh, out was in Orange County with him, uh, and he was, he, you know, very popular there. But, but I do think that there... Um, Orange I don't know. County, California. Yeah, Orange County, California, right. I do, I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that sort of retail politics and interacting with people one-on-one -on -one is going to be his, his problem or is going to be his downfall. Good story, Christine. What's uh, I, I agree. He's, he's 
one of the most natural retail politicians I've ever seen. He, he walks into a room and he, he owns it. And he knows how to talk to everyone and he uh, uh, has a gift, a political gift. And so when it gets down to retail politics as it does, and especially in um, Iowa and New Hampshire, he'll do very well. But here's the, the thing of, of presidential politics. It's all about the picture and it's all about the disciplined message. In Obama, it was hope and change. And, and that's the picture, and that was the message, day in, day out, day in, day out. He has not been able to get it to be, I can create jobs, and I'm ready for this job. It, it, you know, he, 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 his theme is, let's get American working again, but I don't think it, it's, it's Mitt Romney who has the 150-page plan to get American working again. And, and, and so he, there has to be some gravitas, some heft behind his message that convinces people that he can produce with what he's saying. Um, that said, I'll just throw in, I have spent um, an inordinate amount of time in, in Iowa and New Hampshire winters. And uh, for all their lack of diversity, for all the small state, I have to tell you, those people take that responsibility extremely personally and, 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 and seriously. And a lot of the hard questions that he's having trouble with were, pe were questions asked by Iowans and New Hampshires. And they, they didn't come from us. And um, when he gets in those rooms and with even just a single camera rolling, and he's going to have to figure out how you make retail politics also work with message. And uh, because they ask very hard questions and they don't trust anybody until they meet them once or twice. I was just going to say that one of the, it's, I, I'm, I love all of this because I'm a political junkie, but one of the most fascinating aspects of it is to see this Texas governor who, unlike the previous Texas governor, like, it, I mean, he's really, I mean, Bush was mostly from Texas, but he had a lot of East Coast credentials and he went to Yale and he went to Harvard Business School. Perry is 100% Paint Creek. And um, to see him go out there and see how that plays is really fascinating. And I think it plays pretty well in Iowa. I don't think it plays too great in New Hampshire. Um, I'll be shocked if he wins New Hampshire after having been there. I'm not saying it's not possible. I certainly think it's within the realm of possibility. Um, you, there's, there's all kind of factors you can't control for. Um, but it just, I don't think that mixes too well. Um, but I think he's, you know, a natural uh, at this. Uh, he, just the physical contact, I mean, the way like he'll touch babies and kiss babies and stuff, he's so natural at it and, and so comfortable with it. He's very comfortable with people, and Romney is not. And I think that that's going to be something. I mean, Romney is just... Is, Romney's so awkward. Is awkward yeah. with people. And so I do think that that's something that... You know, if I were like the campaign strategist, I would be like, put him with people all the time. In front of cameras. In front of cameras with people, with average people. But uh, again, you, you bring up a very good point. You still, and the, these voters are very sophisticated voters. They're kind of like, they remind me a little bit of West Texas voters where they've read everything, they know everything. It's mostly white audience. Um, you know, they, um, are pretty hard on the candidates, and they're like all undecided. I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, who? Whoa, I'm not decided yet. I haven't had coffee with them three times yet. Right. So <laughs> it's like the old joke about I can't remember if it was New Hampshire or wherever about uh, why didn't you vote for so and so? Well, I only met him twice. Right. All right. Well, I, I want to go one more quick round, and but I, I can't let you go without something you bring up. He's 100% Paint, Paint Creek, and all those white voters. I want to get your reaction to. Not so much the story itself, but certainly kind of almost the meta story of, you know, the Post chasing down this, what, what Christie so diplomatically called the Engate story about the sign with the racial language, the, the, the alleged sign with the racial language, uh, the family hunting lease. Um, you know, what, what was your response to that story? I mean, and I have to ask, did it feel a little weird to see the Washington Post break that story? And do you think it is a story that would break in the national press and not the Texas press? 
Uh, I'll, I'll take it first if you'd like. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, being a, you know, a child of the South and having grown up in, in Southeast Texas, um, I, I was flooded with all kinds of emotions when I w came into this story or read this story. And um, I thought actually Wayne and Christy did a very, very good job of like putting this into a larger context. Um, and I, I think that that it, it is, it's the kind of story that really is nuance filled and needs to have a lot of context and it's, it's multi-layered and it's just as complicated as the experience of race in the South always has been. And I think on the one hand, I look at that and I think, you know, Perry's not like a racist and sitting around dropping the N-word or, uh, you know, that, that's kind of ludicrous. But on the other hand, he has been accused over the years by critics of, of using race in a way that's inflammatory. Um, if, if, if I put out the call right now, I'd really like to see the 1990 ad. I can't, I can't get a hold of it. I'd love to see the 1990 ad uh, in which uh, Jesse Jackson, the, the, the endorsement by Jim Hightower, of Jesse Jackson became a big issue, and it was an ad that some people said was like a Willie Horton it's ad. It's out there. It's out there now. Uh, well, I can, it is out there now. Yes, yeah, somebody somebody had it up yesterday. Oh, great. okay. Well, good. I have not seen it. I've been wanting to look at it. There were two, it. and they've dug one out. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got we got we had the one up that had a picture of it, but not the ad that uh, was straight up on the oh, endorsement. Has the video and everything. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. That I haven't seen, um, but. Uh, there's also, you know, the confed dancing a little bit with the Confederate flag issue and the Sons of the Confederacy license plate. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, and yet on the other hand, there's all of this. Uh, you know, he's appointed the first uh, African American Chief Justice of the of the uh, state Supreme Court, highest, you know, member of the court. And um, I, I do think uh, that the Washington Post story was a went a little long and it was a little bit of like you know what did he know and when did he know it when really you know having grown up in the south it, it's you know if you don't if you haven't visited a racist landmark then you probably didn't spend very much time here christy yes the texas press would have covered it um, but probably we wouldn't have written a 50 inch front page banner story on it and this is because Unfortunately, we grew up in the South and we know that there are racially named landmarks. Matter of fact, I think John Stewart pointed out there, there are some in upper state New York. There are, they are unfortunately all over the place and it's part of, of uh, a checkered history that we have. That, um, that Perry saw the sign and within a soon period of time, his family painted it over and everybody else is mistaken about um, whether they saw it then. The New York, uh, um, excuse me, the, the Post interviewed 12 people and their recollections were pretty shady and all over the map about when they saw it, if they saw it, and how, how it. So um, what it does, though, you could, you could say, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, here's a thought. You know, um, Barack Obama was painted as a racist based on his Reverend Wright and, and, and damn America. And so that was seen as, as, a, as a kind of a reverse racism that was unfitting. Um, he was associated with it. Rick Perry is associated with this. And the question is, are you ready to believe it about this character or, or, or about this person? Because he's, he's not well defined yet in the national dialogue. And that was his danger. He came from a southern state and he is somehow associated with this word. And how does he dig out of that? Now, Jay was kind enough to point to a story that we did that, that looked at what is his, Rick Perry's true history with race in this state, including political uh, uh, commercial that he's run that he hasn't been able, he hasn't been afraid to, to raise race as, as a kind of a tacit issue, to, as a, as a code word to his followers that this guy is really liked by this far out radical black Jesse Jackson and that's not who you want as your agriculture commissioner. Um, but at the same time he's been very proactive in, in uh, 
promoting uh, minorities in the Republican Party where he could find them. And he has, um, and the irony is that he's being attacked on the right for his more moderate stances on immigration and well, being welcoming to Hispanics in Texas. So um, to, to some extent, Perry is being attacked now on the left and the right on the issue of race. So that puts him in a very difficult situation. But once again, it's, uh, his, his narrative is not well known nationally, and now he's associated with this, this word and, and his campaign, I don't think, I, I think it was their first test of the, the explosiveness of how you cannot control a presidential campaign. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, the only thing I would add, just sort of anecdotally, is that, you know, the night, uh, the night after that, um, both, uh, you know, Jay Leno and David Letterman, just right out of the gate, are making jokes about, you know, about Rick Perry being a racist. You know, uh, Leno said something about, uh, you know, he was, he was talking because Herman Cain had come out and said he was the one who really sort of jumped on it and said that it was insensitive and everything. And uh, you know, Leno said Herman Cain would rather go hunting with Dick Cheney than, than Rick Perry. Uh, and uh, you know, so I mean, that's sort of, that's the sort of stuff. I mean, we all know. It's taking an that, easy one, but okay. Yeah, 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 right, right. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that you know sort of seeps in um, through not just you know what you read in the newspaper, but right. it's a it's sort of a cultural thing too. Well, thanks, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it to the audience a little bit. So we'll take questions. Hey, Paul. Um, so if you'll pause a second so that Mike can get the, the microphone to you. I guess while he's taking the microphone to folks, please give him a hand. It was great. <laughs> Why don't we go over here and then go to... I'm trying to grasp this term retail politics. And I, I, was FDR good at retail politics? Was Bill Clinton... Good or, I'm guessing you're going to say FDR was not, but Clinton was. I'm, I'm trying to understand retail politics. It, it's new to me. Retail politics, in, in, in the way I see it, is somebody who can go and shake hands, meet and greets, talk on a, a real personal level to many people, and seem to um, uh, understand where they're coming from and, and, and what's happening in their lives and, and, and bring the national problems down to a more personal level. Um, that to me is, is retail politics and that's what he's very good at in, in terms of walking into a room and being able to talk to anybody um, about what's happening in their lives. And that translates in the camera. You can see it in the camera but you can certainly feel it in the room. I wanted to ask you, just to follow up on that, just real quickly, you two, because Jason mentioned this. Do you guys agree that Romney doesn't have it? Oh, no. Yeah, he, he, I mean, there's been just, you know, one example after another where he sort of just, you know, there were awkward moments uh, with real people. But, uh, you know, wholesale politics would be advertising and messaging and television and retail politics is, you know, kind of like it sounds, just on that micro level of, of, you know, like door-to-door, -door, for example. I mean, Perry was a Bible salesman and apparently a very good door-to-door -door Bible salesman at, at one point. You know, in some surprises, ways he still is. Surprises none of us uh, here. Um, but uh, he is he is very good at that. I think Bill Clinton, that's actually a very good comparison. You really can't make that up. Next question. I'm going to go back to Paul and then over here to Dave. Actually, I can think of somebody who's worse as a retail guy, and that was Al Gore. He almost got elected president. Um, if I'm getting calls from national reporters, I'm assuming that you guys are getting many more, okay? And they're asking me the same question, which is, who is this guy? Because remarkably, after 10, 11 years as governor, he's really uh, exceptionally unknown for somebody running for president of the United States for people up in, in Washington and New York. My question is, the, the sense that I'm getting, especially when I talk to those same people after the debates, uh, the question they ask is, is this guy capable of doing any better? Uh, because what I'm getting is that this guy is really bad, you know, in terms of, in terms of just the way he's been with the media. They, everybody thinks he's fabulous in terms of retail politics, but that only takes you so far in a presidential campaign. My question is, is there a certain tipping point? Now, this is absurdly... Uh, long before the actual election. I mean, at this point in time, I think in four years ago, McCain's campaign was dead. But then remember, McCain you know, had you know, a long body of, of knowledge with the press and with the public. 
Is there a certain tipping point where people just look, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking with the press, the other national press about this, where people say, you know, Romney, Romney's going to beat Obama, you know, unless he makes a mistake, and Perry's, you know, you're taking a real chance if you nominate Rick Perry for president. This is among Republican consultants, Republican activists. That Jason, I think you were talking about some of the people that have been endorsing Romney early on. Is there a sense of that at all, or, or is this really, really, really way too early to be even talking about that? Is there a sense that that, that Perry is is putting himself in a position where he becomes unelectable among Republican elites? who you know, may not care one way or the other how ideologically right-wing somebody is as long as they actually can win. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there is a lot of that concern out there, and it's been out there about him, I think, even since before the, even since before he announced, you know, there was talk about, uh, well, this could go one of two ways. He could really just sort of, uh, you know, rock it to the top and sort of set the, take the field by storm, or he could really implode. Well. We've seen signs of both um, so far, so we'll, you know, we'll kind of we'll wait and, and and see how it is, how it ends. Um, but you know, I mean, I do think that uh, that there, I think that there are probably Republican elites. I, I, I would say most Republican elites, whatever that means, or people in Washington, you know, establishment Republicans, however you want to say it, who feel like, uh, not without reason, that Romney is the safer nominee for them in, in, in the sense that he probably isn't as explosive as Perry, um, and he, he, at least on paper right now, has a better chance of beating Obama. Um, at the same time, you know, one, uh, you know, I think those people have less control over things than they used to. Um, two, uh, you know, there's a question about could, could Romney excite the Republican base as much as Perry could. Um, and then, and then also, I think you know. I mean, you look at you look at national polls, you know, that sort of do these hypothetical head-to-head -head matchups or whatever. And yes, a million things will happen before the election. Yes, it's way too early to be doing those, and they're kind of trivial at this point. But they do show Perry and Obama running neck and neck. So um, you know, th for everything that Perry's been through, and I think he'll be through a lot more. I mean, I don't think that necessarily his worst days of this campaign are behind him. Um, but you know, he is he is right there. Um, you know, it's not it's not like it's just automatic. Uh, you know, Obama would win 45 states against him. I think it's an interesting question in, the, in this election about where the heart and soul of the Republican Party is going to go, and that's one of the most interesting aspects of it. I think it's very true that, as you point out, that Wall Street, the so-called country club Republicans, are, are very much leaning towards Romney, and the Tea Party populist evangelical base is um, uh, seeming to line up either between Michelle Bachman, who will probably fade out, she's running out of money, and and Perry, and so this is this is uh, which way is this party going to go? Because uh, to some extent, that's the, those are the oil and water of, of politics, and they don't seem to want the same kind of candidate or the same kind of message, and so it will be a very interesting telling of how far right the Republican Party wants to go. I think uh, there, there's two issues here. One is electability in the fall, and one is can he win the primary, and they're really two completely different worlds. I think that uh, Romney has suggested, and a lot of pundits and experts have suggested, that Perry has done things that get him ever closer to unelectability in the fall, whether it's his position on Social Security, um, or his shaky debate performances, or this whole gritty underbelly of Texas that is just like trickles out daily, sort of. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that you have to keep in mind in the primary, there's two really big factors that we haven't really hit on a lot, and one is money, and the super PACs uh, allow you, I mean, really, if Perry did not raise another dime, he probably, he'll, he'll definitely make it to Iowa on, on $17 million. There is not a question in my mind that Rick Perry will be in this race when they are voting in Iowa. Um, beyond that, you know, we'll see what happens after that. But um, the super PACs, which are these unregulated or much less regulated committees, can take 
unlimited amounts of money, and in some cases, you know, they're setting up organizations where you don't, we won't even find out who it is that's given money to it. Um, and so, you know, they can keep, you can, you can take $17 million, pay all your staff, get all your consultants, you don't have to, you, you would never have to run a TV ad. The super PACs could run all the TV ads. You can say, oh, well, I don't know anything about that. I'm not coordinate with them. You know, I, it's just run by my, it's just, my run by my former chief. Of it's staff. just run by Mike Toomey, but you know, I haven't talked to Mike in a while. Tell him hello if you see him. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I mean, you have to keep. And the other, well, the other factor is proportionality. The, one of the reasons that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton went so long was because of the proportional. And and Barack Obama got that. It was like. You know, hey, it's not about winning some high-profile media contest that then propels you into the next one, and then it's when you get this winner-take-all thing, and you amass so much support, and you get this big head of steam. It's like you actually go into states, and the the, the way it's very complicated. I'm not going to say I understand it completely, but it's it's a very very big factor in that. You this. can accumulate stuff without right. without winning at all. Yeah, I mean, I I want to go to Dave. I, you know, the other thing I would I would add to that a little bit is that. I'm still not completely convinced, and we'll look at the fundraising money and really kind of break that down a little more, that that break between the Republican elite and the Republican primary voter, Tea Party insurgency, whatever you want to call it, is quite as cleanly horizontal as it looks. I mean, I think the more complicated story here is the divisions in the, among what we're calling the elites in the Republican Party, many of whom are still making up their mind. Now, it may well be that some of those people are being scared by Perry's performance, but there are deep reservations about Romney out there, I think. Mike to Dave. In terms of issues, there so far really seems to be only one in Perry's campaign, which is jobs. Now, there are two really interesting aspects to that, it seems. One is that the jobs in Texas are bad jobs, better than nothing, but they're low pay, they're, they're beneath the way a lot of people think, like college graduates, for example, think of what they ought to be doing, et cetera. The other is, uh, something we're seeing now in the Occupy America movement that the criticism of the establishment of the banks as not lending and of the businesses as hoarding cash and not hiring, how far can you push the argument, well, I'm Mr. Jobs, when the only jobs that have been created under your leadership are not very good jobs and when the people who ought to be interested in hiring the big corporations and the and the banks and all are doing the opposite they're actually laying off people do you think he can craft a jobs message that can overcome those two problems he he has been talking about the texas texas miracle a million jobs in 10 years uh, i don't care how you slice it it sounds pretty good and um, when you start peeling away the layers and you recognize that uh, a disproportionate number of them are, are low-paying jobs, minimum wage jobs, when you realize that his predecessors have done as well, if not better, in creating jobs, when you realize that a lot of it is based on where we are in Texas, our, our, our blessed geography that gives us mineral wealth and a border with Mexico, our biggest trading partner, uh, and, a, and a coastline through which to ship. I, yeah, but whether you're losing jobs or whether you're gaining jobs, if you're at the top, you get the, the credit or the blame. Right now, I would say that anybody who won the presidency three years ago would be in this situation. And I would say that if you've created a million jobs in your state in the last 10 years, you could propel that into a race for the presidency. Now, how that plays out, I, I guess that's why we're all waiting for the votes. I don't know. I don't know if, you know, but I know this. I know people are mad at Washington. They are mad at Congress. If, if they actually, you know, um, uh, enforced contempt of Congress, we'd all be in prison. So, uh, so you know, when, when, yeah, when you're part of, when, when you're the president presiding over this, you're in trouble. And so right now, you know, it, that either a Romney or a Perry, so very different candidates, are running so well against Barack Obama is, is a matter of circumstances more than personalities right now. So who wins the Republican primary will have a darn good chance of being our next president. I would say that um, 
Perry's opponents will muddy the waters a little bit on the jobs issue. I'd say it's probably a net positive for him, um, the, uh, just comparatively um, and just as a sound bite. Um, I think that, uh, that what's really been striking, though, is how little he's been able to talk about jobs. It really, I, I, I don't agree with you in this sense, is that it really hasn't been the issue. I mean, he's been struggling mightily to get back to that conversation. All we can talk about is HPV and immigration, which actually immigration, as, as Jim has told me a million times, and I've used this and did not give you credit for it, is a proxy for economic concerns. Because uh, when, the, when economic anxiety is high, then immigration becomes an issue. And I, I've been struck with how really important the immigration issue has been. I mean, I, every, I, I can't think of a, of a retail voter event where the voters got to actually ask questions that it didn't come up. Or, or if it didn't come up, it was because they didn't call on the voter that it was like, you know, hey, 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 I've got an immigration or fence issue, you know? Right. Hey, we have time for one more. We'll take two more if you guys, if you guys just both be brief and I'll get you both. All right. Um, there was a lot of talk when Perry was getting ready to get into the race that uh, he would try to get as far to the right as he could and not let any of the current candidates get to the right of him. And it seems that the narrative has sort of changed in that he's getting attacked both from the right and the left, uh, especially with the Bachman um, HPV thing. Do you think that going forward he'll try to get further to the right or he'll try to f thread the needle um, to sort of not get too far to the right so that when the general campaign goes, if he gets that far, to be able to get further to the center. I mean, answer real quickly. I, I think going into this, they made a calculated decision recognizing that immigration, HPV, the Trans-Texas Corridor, these things would be problems on the right, even though he's a very conservative candidate. And they made a calculated decision, we will defend them. We will not go back from them, we will defend. And, um, uh, and we will explain our positions. And because there's only two ways you can go. You defend it or you say, upon further consideration, that was wrong. So uh, I, I Which think. Which he has done on HPV a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> just lucky. a little, though. Yeah, yeah just, just a little. Just right. a little under withering criticism. Well, basically, they resorted to process, which is always, you know, if they're resorting to explaining through process, they're, you know. They're so, trying to split the difference. Right. So yeah. I, I think to, you know, and, and its process on immigration, too, right. uh, well, only four people voted against it. So I, I think they made a calculated decision that they were going to stand their ground. And right. And, let's, you know, let's, it was hard to get to the right of Michelle Bachman. <laughs> All right, last one. Um, I, I recently saw another story about uh, Perry's office, kind of the way they, the speed they use to destroy documents such as emails within a seven day time frame, I believe. Uh, are the media outlets in which you represent interested in creating a greater accountability for getting those documents or maybe delaying the destruction of them? I, I would say yes, we are, and we've all written about it. Um, and it was a huge issue in the 2010 campaign. It's become a, uh, or, and before that, it's, it's become an issue again. Um, and, and what, and Perry's pretty much said that that's the policy of his office is destroy email after seven days. Um, they've, they've been fairly, uh, certainly the, the Department of Public Safety has not been the paragon of uh, transparency in terms of how much the security costs uh, for you know the governor's protective detail is we're not getting a whole lot of those records, um, so you know that that has been an issue. I would say though that it, that's a classic example of where we've written about it and written about it ad nauseum, and it and, still and goes gone to, on. Yeah. It, and then people are like, "Why isn't the press writing about this?" And I'm like, "We are." And where's the public outrage? I don't know. I mean, if, if the public, I, I feel I feel like it's okay as a journalist. I feel like I need to be objective. But when it comes to transparency, I think it's okay for me to err on the side of more transparency. But I don't really see this being an issue that the public gets worked up about. No, you're right. There's been no shortage of coverage, of it. and the media organizations have gone to court over a lot of these issues. Um, and you know, uh, so far the public in Texas, despite a lot of ink about it, a, a lot of money spent on on lawsuits and everything, um, have not pushed back against Perry on that. And we've lost before the Texas Supreme Court. 
Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, basically, we, we've gotten our, you know, what's handed to us on, on this time and time again. And um, I, think, I think that it's going to have to come up, come from the public to, to want the records. I mean, for, you know, there's always this talk of, like, it's your tax money. And I, and I sometimes I want to say, you know, it's also your records. It's the public's records, but they, it just it doesn't doesn't have that kind of resonance. Well, it's an issue. I, I think in, in resisting this, it's it's easy to portray the press as is self interested, despite that argument, right? And then right, you there, know, the Perry campaign is very good at that. There's a reason he he's destroying them after seven days. He doesn't want the record because the, he knows that we'll look through it, and there's always something you can find to criticize, or, or maybe he spoke out and it went you know a zig when he should have zagged. I understand that after how you know 20 years as governor, however long he's going to be governor, I wonder what his library will look like. It's going to be one box because there's there there is virtually nothing on the record of what he's felt or did or prevented uh, that will still exist. That makes him a true fiscal conservative. It does. All right. With that, uh, once again, Jason Embry, Christy Hoppy, Jay Root. Thanks a lot for making time. I know you guys are busy.